My name is Morba Ja, and I'm an aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics professor at the University of Texas at Austin, where I lead a transdisciplinary research program in space safety, security, and sustainability. And I've partnered with Spacewatch.Global to start a new series of web talks, cafes, space cafes called Morba's Vox Populi, which is Latin for people's voice. So I hope to see you there. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be candid conversations about all sorts of stuff related to space safety, security, and sustainability. I am a space watcher. It's Thursday afternoon in Europe. It's Space Cafe Moribas Vox Populi time. Our next edition will begin soon. As always, we really appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback. We will learn and improve based on the feedback you give us. My name is Kara Monter. I'm the event coordinator at Spacewatch Global and host of our Space Cafe Benelux. Spacewatch Global is a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters that showed their commitment to keeping our independent journalism alive. We really appreciate that. And I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe, Space Cafe podcasts. <laughs> and for all our fans of audio content, we have new episodes of our Space Cafe radio on the road in Brussels from the EU Space Conference just a couple of weeks ago. One of them is an interview with Josef Aschbacher, the director of the European Space Agency by our publisher, Torsten. We are available on all major podcast platforms. So just type in Space Cafe Radio and you'll be sure to find us. We also keep our fan shop online open for you to support us actively and become a space watcher. If you've missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our webpage in the event section and on our YouTube channel. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to hand you over to your host today, Professor Marie Baja, over to you. Aloha, aloha, everybody uh, around the globe. It's another exciting session of Space Cafe's Morbus Vox Populi. Um, I wanna say, uh, first and foremost, thank you, Chiara, thank you, Torsten, uh, for, for working with me uh, and continuing this great dialogue and conversation around space safety, security and sustainability stuff. We have a very exciting uh, session today. And interestingly enough, um, you know, not that uh, long ago, this movie came out, Don't Look Up, with, uh, um, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio and, and Jennifer Lawrence. And it was one of those things where, you know, there was mixed reviews uh, across the community. And so people kind of asked me what I thought about it. And uh, I actually hadn't watched it until I got enough uh, people around the globe kind of saying, hey, what's your opinion about this? I'm like, well, maybe I should watch it so that, so that I can have an opinion. I tend to not really like these sorts of movies. Like the movie Gravity is like one of the things that like makes my blood boil every time I watch that thing. But in any case, I digress. Um, so yeah, don't look up. And when I watched the movie, I don't want to give too many spoilers, uh, but since we're going to talk about it, I, th I think uh, if you haven't watched the movie, then maybe you should plug your ears or something. But um, this whole idea of you know, scientists uh, noticing that there's some event that would forever change the landscape, you know, literally and figuratively of humanity, and they're sounding the alarm on this sort of sort of thing and trying to get governments involved in that sort of thing. And just seeing this kind of apathetic, lackadaisical response. In the, in the end, the bad thing actually happens. Um, and it just, it made me feel very frustrated. Uh, I felt very connected to uh, these scientists. I felt uh, very empathetic to them because in many respects, I feel uh, a very similar way when it comes to space sustainability issues and, and orbital debris and where that is going and the space traffic problems that we face. And so 
it just occurred to me, you know, this Morbus Vox Populi is all about having candid conversations, lounge chair kind of discussions with folks from across the globe. And so today I want to introduce my panel. Uh, basically, I have Aaron Boley. He's a co-director of the Outer Space Institute coming to you live from uh, British Columbia. So uh, thank you so much, Aaron, for being here. We have uh, Angela Matisse. She's a chief executive of Think Tank Mass Limited and uh, our privateer uh, you know, in the UK. We have Professor Annette Lee, and she's a professor of astronomy and physics at St. Cloud State University. And she also brings uh, an indigenous voice to the table, which is great. We have Diana, Diana Klochkova, who is our branding and communications lead at Privateer Space. And she brings a very unique perspective to this as well. We have Diana Umpiere, and she's a representative of the Sierra Club. And I've worked with her before on things related to light pollution, uh, you know, this dark sky kind of thing, what's happening to our skies and these human-made objects in space reflecting things back to the planet, whether it's for astronomy or just looking at the sky and seeing it change. And how do people feel about that? Uh, we have Jackie Hoover uh, from Hawaii, and she also brings uh, an indigenous voice to the table. I've been working with Jackie on uh, you know, through Privateer. And by the way, so yeah, I'm associate professor at UT Austin, but I'm also a co-founder and chief scientist at Privateer. So we're working together on um, basically an educational outreach and, and working with uh, Native Hawaiians and bringing in their uh, concepts and, and their uh, traditions of sustainability and how can we use that for space. And then last but not least, my brother, Tomas Riemer, uh, founding partner and co-CEO at Space Hero, and, and I'm also uh, uh, a global space advisor for Space Hero and uh, definitely changing the, the, the narrative when it comes to access to space for everybody. So with that, um, I just want to see from anybody in the panel, um, you know, given this whole don't look up, how did, you know, how did people feel about that movie? Any sort of what are the takeaways, you know, yeah, what did people feel about it? So I'll just kind of open it up and see who wants to kick that off. I want. All right. Because it was about entertainment and so was uh, looking up. And, um, you know, I found it cringeworthy as you do. I loved <laughs> Jonah Hill as chief of staff. Of course, that was the most accurate depiction of anything, right? Brilliantly done. Um, on the lesson of the movie, it's interesting that uh, it displayed a very, very, very realistic ending, which is unusual for Hollywood. And uh, I really uh, enjoyed that, I have to say. Uh, I thought that, um, you know, we see this very often when we raise topics uh, that people don't want to hear about. They don't want to hear about it, right? And uh, they just, um, you know, shut it out. Essentially, um, the attention span goes, doesn't go beyond friends and family. You know, if you want to talk about greater things and things that are that far away, it is difficult when they come with a problem. When they come with a hope, of course, everybody is looking forward to it. So when you talk about Mars and uh, sending people to Mars, people are like, oh, yeah, let's do it. But when you talk about space debris, it's like, wow, what are you talking about? And uh, so I think the session today would be awesome to tackle that because we, as Space Hero, we have the Vox Populi right, uh, right uh, in our fan base. And uh, we want to give them good answers. That's why I'm here today. And uh, I'm looking forward to listening to all the contributions from all the panelists. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Thomas. Anybody else? I'll go. Um... All right. For me, I thought it was brave, you know, and I and you, you can see what you like about Hollywood, but they do produce brave, satirical stuff, and this was satire, you know, one on one. I mean, it was it was it was entertaining, and you know, and there's nothing like entertaining people for them to get a message. So I thought, and I thought the actors stepping forward to do it, a great job of the caricatures that they played. 
um, and it was all very clear who, who they were supposed to be. Uh, but I thought, you know, it was a parody. For, for me, it was a parody of uh, where humanity actually is today. You know, the whole fragmentation of opinions, fragmentation of nations. Um, man, we have a heterogene heterogeneous planet and we've got to figure out how to bring everyone together for a common goal. And with everyone with skin in the game in that common goal, and I think that movie was teaching us over. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Angela. Who wants to go next? Well, for me, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Diana. <laughs> um, just quickly to say that uh, the fact that the movie was so popular and the fact that it made it into this pop culture sphere, um, let alone the content of it and how it, it was executed, but the fact that it started that public conversation in a way that kind of snuck in through entertainment, I think that's a huge part of the equation and a huge win in and of itself for me. Nice. I think, I think yeah, so I want to come back to how it comes in through the pop culture thing, maybe in a little bit. Yeah, thank you. Jackie? So that was actually a great segue for me from Diana because as a native Hawaiian and Navajo, um, of being of Native Hawaiian and Navajo descent, um, some of the conversation that was brought up as a result of the movie is of existential threat, which as indigenous people, we live with every day. So I think it was interesting, as Diana said, for some of these difficult conversations and um, perceptions to make its way into pop culture and to everyday dialogue. And it's something that some of us are already having every day. I think that's very interesting, Jackie. And the this idea of uh, native, uh, native peoples, indigenous peoples in this existential threat as a daily basis, I think we need to come back to that at some point. But, but uh, let, I'm going to just table that for now. and, and I can see somebody else wants to chime in. Okay, let's 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 go with you, uh, the other Diana. Diana, so you can go with Diana. That will make Diana, it easy. Diana, Diana. <laughs> Sounds good. Perfecto. Well, I'll just make a quick confession that I did not watch the film until this past uh, Saturday, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, in fact, I'm going to read a portion of what I posted on my Facebook account on um, December 29, and I says. I'm not sure I'll care to see Netflix don't look up. From what I gather so far, it's a movie with famous actors playing astronomers ignored about a looming crisis that they discovered. But instead of Netflix and the actors talking about what's really happening to astronomy right now, most folks are drawing parallels to climate crisis, how climate scientists are being ignored, and so I say, here's the irony. Real astronomy scientists are truly being ignored today, uh, maybe even by some climate scientists. Um, I won't go up with the rest, but, but my, my first, I, I just didn't want to watch it because I, I was already furious um, about, you know, people not realizing just how serious the situation is after you know last summer I started engaging with um, astronomers in the know, so so that was my my you know after the dust settled, uh, you know I finally well, watched it. Well, so Diana, I just I think for for everybody here, um, you clearly know the problem, but we haven't really talked about that. So the thing is, why don't you just say a few things about what this problem to astronomy is just so that the people the listening in can kind of you know follow you right yeah and i'm going to let some of the astronomers that because i am not an astronomer i you know my uh involvement in this originally started by just caring about you know the quality of the night sky and but through that work i got to meet a lot of real astronomers um you know that gather real sensitive data and um and so it was, you know, 2019, um, all of a sudden, you know, Starlink um, satellites are going up and there's a few voices in the astronomy community that I'm like, uh oh, this stuff is showing up in our images. Um, and I'll be honest, back at the time, 
you know, I didn't think it was such a big deal. Um, I didn't know that many details. Um, I do remember watching a train of, um, of startling satellites going over my head um, in the middle of the Everglades in one of our dark sky um, areas. Um, and I panicked, but again, I didn't realize the, you know, I thought of it as only a threat to um, stargazing, you know, so some astronomers, uh, I didn't think about the bigger picture and all the other issues that came in. So, um, you know, I think, you know, one of the other astronomers can talk in more details, but, you know, the concerns have been that um, the community in general, you know, seem to have kind of gotten, um, you know, surprised by, by the kind of impacts that would be seen, particularly again, you know, professional astronomers that, that are seeing data in a very sensitive uh, manner, you know, that normally the rest of us, you know, don't get to experience. Um, and that has, you know, that has since then created um, a lot of dialogue between the astronomy community and the, um, you know, at the companies that are launching these um, satellites and, and a lot of others in the community such as Moriba and so many others that are starting to like grow the bigger picture, you know, as to what is that gonna do to access to space and, and all the other things, so. So, so Diana, you. as you're talking about this, I'm just gonna show this movie that we did that kind of shows people kind of what we're talking about, right? So this is basically predicting light pollution. All these streaks are human-made objects that are reflecting light towards the telescope in Chile. And this is just, you know, several views of this. Like if you're at the site looking up, this is uh, on a celestial sphere around the globe. This is uh, as if you were at the telescope looking up, the gray parts are below the horizon. And each of these tiles are places in the sky that astronomers care about. So when, when Diana's talking about this, this is what we're talking about. You know, it's like right now, the space traffic, uh, the space debris, satellites, rocket bodies are all reflecting light towards, uh, you know, astronomical instruments. And it's basically like clutter. You know, I'm, I'm not going to show the whole thing, but I, anyway, I just thought it was useful because it's hard to, for people to get their minds wrapped around this stuff. And sometimes, you know, movies and pictures can really convey this stuff, but it's just kind of showing you this is the clutter, the current day clutter that astronomers have to contend with, you know, on a nightly basis. So anyway, I just and wanted to- And it's current day, and that's the important part, it's current day. Yeah, this that's right. what's coming. Yeah, that's yeah, it. I want to jump in with, uh, you know, a question. Isn't it when we talk about new developments, Ryan, isn't it always about keeping a status quo that is basically unharmful for um, humankind? And then when does the harm start? And I think every problem on this planet has only been solved, and it sounds very harsh what I'm about to say, but it's actually the truth, if people have died. When people have died from something, uh, um, other people pick it up and say that shouldn't happen again. And usually then we have technical progress, we have improvements, right? Uh, I believe that uh, the topic of space debris is really going to become an issue when one of those pieces hits an incoming or outgoing a spacecraft with humans in it, and we will have um, uh, dead bodies that we have to account for. And uh, of course we all want to prevent it, but are we really thinking that we can move mountains um, to make that happen? And how do we make it happen? Whatever I read about space debris in my eyes is, um, you know, how do you pick it out of the sky? It's difficult, right? It's a physical process uh, that needs to be uh, put in place. And I have no idea you know, if this could even work. And I'm sure that millions of people are asking themselves that. I never came across space to be, by the way, in all of my life until three years ago when I met Moriba for the first time. And he spoke about it in 2019 in Abu Dhabi, remember Moriba? I and, know, absolutely. And, uh, and I was like stunned, you know, that this is already a topic. And um, I thought myself to be interested in everything that happens on this planet, but I'd never heard about it, right? So three years in now, I get it. 
I totally see the, the importance of addressing it, right, before things happen. But I'm not very hopeful that we will do until things happen. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. I see, Aaron, you have your hand up, my friend. Go on, brother. And then, and then we'll also get to uh, Annette. Uh, thank you so much, Morva. Uh, when I was watching the movie, uh, I had a hard time getting through it because I, I, have, I just have a difficulty with that type of uh, humor. Uh, and it also may be rather frustrated in multiple ways. Uh, and I think, Deanna, if we're bringing up the, the light pollution issue, which I, I hope is something we do talk a little bit more about. Uh, very quickly, uh, with a comment following up with uh, Thomas's, though, it, it is true that a lot of the things that we see action on uh, results from some type of disaster. We didn't see double hulls in oil tankers until the Valdez uh issue, um, which led to a widespread environmental disaster. Um, but we also saw some pretty um, uh, swift action on taking care of the ozone layer when it became very clear what was happening. So we have some counter examples there as well. We had the Vienna Convention on the, um, on the protection of the ozone layer, followed by the Montreal Protocol, which has been a major success. Sure. Um, and so, um, but then again, there's also the Minamata Convention on Mercury, also a success, as, I mean, so far, uh, but it did come after people were getting really, really sick from mercury poisoning. So we have examples of both of these things uh, in different areas. Uh, so humanity can act, but you have to have a lot of uh, things lined up in order for that to happen. For the light pollution, uh, you know, this is something that is, is hard to really put into uh, words because it's something that you need to experience to truly appreciate how it's changing the night sky. Our use of space is changing the night sky. So I live close to about 50 degrees north latitude. And so what happens uh, during the summer during the few precious hours of night that we do have, the night is alive now with stars that move. And so you're just watching and already you just see the satellites going across the sky and they vary in brightness. And it's all night long, not just during the morning or evening, during that time of year. Mm -hmm. And you can watch the, your favorite constellation. You can look at your favorite object in the sky and you see all these things moving around, these fireflies. And eventually all the stars start to move because it's this optical illusion. We start to lose a sense of our history in the sky, of who we are, uh, of things that we've known. Uh, and so it has that real, both natural and cultural impact. And here's the thing, we all suffer from light pollution but we can go to a park. We can go camping to escape that. We can find places where there are still dark skies, but there's nowhere that you can go to escape humanity, how the impact that humanity is having on the night sky. And connecting it, finally, and I'll end here for this, this time, connecting it with the movie itself, one of the things that light pollution is uh, from satellites is doing is it's going to affect planetary defense surveys. The thing that Don't Look Up was discussing. So a lot of the surveys have to work at um, the twilight, during the twilight times, just because of the proximity of the observations in the direction of the sun. Uh, and with a lot of satellites causing a lot of confusion within the data, it impacts our time. It impacts the time we have to detect an object because there can be confusion, there could be limitations, and time is the, one of the biggest things we need when it comes to a planetary defense emergency. So this topic of space junk is so directly tied to uh, the movie from that aspect. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, no, thank you, Ern. And um, let, let's let, 
let hey we need to let uh, Annette we need to not let Annette say a few things Thomas sorry sorry just one one thing on on Aaron when you look at planetary defense right which country are you looking from that is also a big big question because the Russians destroying old satellites and putting even more debris into space is very clearly already an attack on a global planetary defense system because it's clearly a national attack against another nation that will have problems with it, right? So just say. All right, thank you. Annette. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, um, I'm gonna introduce myself quickly and then weigh in on the movie. So Anin uh, Han, hello, Metakwe Oyasen. My name is Annette, Annette Lee, and I am mixed race Lakota. I am an astronomer and a visual artist. My organization is called Native Skywatchers, indigenous led grassroots organization. I wanna say that I'm speaking to you from Mani Sota Makoche, which is the land where the water reflects the sky, Minnesota, Minneapolis. This is the original territory of the Dakota and later Ojibwe peoples. And these are my communities. Lastly, I wanna acknowledge that we are living in a global pandemic, COVID times. So it's important to acknowledge the people that have been lost, that have died at this time that we're enduring. So I wanna acknowledge them. I greet you with a good heart and good mind. So Pilamia, thank you for having me um, and hearing um, a few words. About the movie, I just wanna say that I think that the power of the arts is oftentimes to hold the mirror, to hold the mirror to us to say, hey, look, we're caught up in this moment. And this moment is something that we're, it's culture. It's not ethnicity, it's a bigger umbrella. And it's what it means to be living as a human being right now. Much of it's unconscious. But the powerful, one of the powerful things about the arts is that it can hold up the mirror to say, look at what you're, you're, in, you're going through right now. So I think the movie was profound in that way to hold up the mirror. And I also think that it's important that it's bigger than the movie in just one movie because that apathy in the face of extinction is a product of everything that we're living through and that this moment is a product of our history. So if you think about it, what happened in the movie that people didn't care, they didn't believe, they were confused and everything, that same thing is happening with COVID. The message is very simple. We share one sky. We share one air. But as human beings, we, we're having a hard time with the message. So I just like to throw out um, that we, we need to really look at the bigger picture because if we're gonna talk about the movie, um, mass extinction, if we're gonna talk about COVID, if we're gonna talk about light pollution, we're gonna talk about stat satellite constellations, planetary defense, all of these things and the way that we are not addressing these crises and think of all the crises, climate change, climate disaster, plastics, animal extinction. I mean, the list goes on and on, it's overwhelming, right? But to really, contribute to this. And I'm sure we want to contribute because we're here in this coffee table conversation and we have gifts and we have a certain amount of voice and privilege. So if we really want to contribute, what we have to do is go back to the roots, the cause. We have to look at colonization. We have to look at industrialization. We have to look at consumerism and capitalism. And COVID is holding up the mirror, just like the movie. And so it's up to us. What, do, what are we going to do about it now that we see the problem? And, and I think that's really we, where we can contribute the most. So, Pilamia. I, lo 
Yeah, I, 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 I love that. Um, I'm going to bring somebody up from the audience to ask questions, but Angela, I see that you want to interject real quick. Yeah, because I want to, um, from what Annette said, because um, you're touching on something which is really fundamental. It's the nature of, of humanity uh, on the planet and the way our societies are. We are, I said the word, heterogeneous, um, where, you know, where we're kind of all digging into, you know, we've all, you know, the space plans, for example, people have all got their own space, place plans to do. But the important thing, and I think what you were saying is we have to understand, we have to have a will to understand others and what their needs are in terms of what their strategies are going to be and find out. And I think it's flipped from that heterogeneous approach to the development of space and space projects and, and unify around this common goal so that I said it before we have skin we all have skin in the game if you think about for example um, during the cold war the ISS was born right so you had Russia and the USA um, developed the ISS so despite what was going on in sort of cold war times it was it was so it was really, really, you have to have this will to collaborate, will to learn what the others want, will to collaborate um, and invite widely. So I think when people are doing a project and when the space agencies and the, you know, the folks, the space commands are doing, let's be inclusive. Because if we don't, you can get away with that level of competition, which is human nature on Earth. It's kind of like, you know, that's what we, that's what we live by as a com competitive environment. But it's pretty disastrous in space. In fact, it's probably suicidal if we have some commonality of understanding how we should develop this in space. Thank you, Angela. Look, um, Diana, I, I, I'm looking at your facial expressions, and I don't know if you wanted to say something before I go to somebody from the audience. Yeah, yeah. I think um, just, you know, I, I bring a I think a, a different perspective from most folks here because I am very new to this issue. Um, yeah, I began with Privateer officially last week, um, but I spent the last four years working at StarTalk with Neil deGrasse Tyson and, and uh, facing a, a more general challenge of capturing attention for science communication. Um, so I think Angela, I, I love all your points about cooperation um, and and understanding and empathy, and that's something I've heard a lot of from Morba. But I think that there's a step there, and you know, I have a marketing background. There's a a funnel for everything, a marketing funnel. You can't really engage and and recruit empathy and and do it until you have people's attention. And I think that there's, you know, it's more difficult than ever, and will continue to become more difficult. Uh, to capture attention in this age where so much information is coming at people on a daily basis. And there's a lot of alarmism, there's a lot of, uh, you know, clickbait of, of various kinds. And so how do we get people to understand what really is important is exaggerated for their attention. Um, and that's a challenge, and that's why I do celebrate this movie again, because it, it's at least starting the conversation. It's a hook, right? Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson talks a lot about, because he really uses pop culture to try to infuse science and find opportunities for education. There's a scaffolding there. Now there's a common knowledge, a common understanding from the movie with someone who maybe had no concept of any of this beforehand. Now we have a starting point, a hook into that person to have a bigger conversation and a more structured conversation around the real issues. Thank you so much. Let's go with um, very good points, Diana, thank you. Um, so let's bring people up from the audience. How about Gianmarco Lugeri? Hello, everyone, can you hear me? Salve, ciao. Ciao. Th thank you very much for this uh, opportunity for the nice panel and all the ideas. Uh, I'm, Ita I'm, I'm an Italian student uh, working in uh, studying in the Netherlands, and I am graduating in uh, strategic design 
which is how to apply creativity to solve very complex systemic problems. And my graduation pro uh, project is about space debris. So yeah, my question is totally reconnecting to what uh, Diana is saying. Uh, so do you think that in the movie, Don't Look Up, uh, also an, uh, a point against the scientists were, was raised uh, so that maybe sometimes they are not capable of communicating with the society through mass media? Oh, so what, yeah, so what is your question then? My question is, uh, the, the what are, what are the problems uh, with scientists to to, commun to communicate through mass media to the society if there are problems? Okay, well, in that case, I wanna see who, for, okay, I see Thomas has his hand raised and then Diana. Yeah, I just wanna say that, of course, it's hard for scientists to communicate with the public because there are two different languages at play. If you dive into a subject uh, very, very deeply, like um, you do when you study, uh, then you know try to talk this uh, through with somebody that has no clue that just wants to be entertained, right? And um, it is a dichotomy that uh, we at Space Hero try to solve because as part of what we're doing, we will invite the science community uh, to be part of this, right? Not only. Um, part of you know all the challenges that we are putting up, but also part of the communication channel. Uh, we, when Debs and I started to uh, you know look into the space industry, uh, we figured very quickly that this is an echo chamber, and that you know all the wonderful things uh, that are done are never reaching the public. Right? That needs to change. You know, things can be uh, told in easy words, in simple words, so that everybody can understand it and it will still smarten people up instead of dumbing them down. So we create more platforms where scientists can actually speak and uh, Space Cafe is already a good uh, platform, a good start. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. How about you, Diana? Yeah, so, um, you know, so for example, what part of the movie, and that's why it made it easier for me to watch, I ended up analyzing the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, <laughs> wow. I, I mean, managed to survive it. Take and notes get... during the movie, nice. Oh, yeah, my poor son, he, we kept stopping the film and rewinding so I could capture the things. So, you know, so, so they started talking about this comet coming from the Oort cloud. And, you know, and, you know, I remember when they, when they went to the White House to give their briefing. I mean, you know, first, you know, they're told, you have 20 minutes to talk about this comet thing, right? And, and they just lost it. In the, in the beginning, just the seriousness. Um, and I kind of thought about, you know, last summer when, you know, I got a chance, you know, Moriva, if you remember, you came in and we gave this um, introduction of the issues to some um, people within, you know, Sierra Club, just to start getting their reactions. What is it, what can we learn from this interaction? And it was really interesting, you know, what we learn, you know, some of the things that we learn is that the framing, the messaging, the messenger, um, the terminology that you use, the visuals that you use, that all of that matters. You know, that summer, most of us that were engaged on this issue, we were using terms like mega constellation, SATCOM. You know, sp space itself is a term that we don't truly relate to, you know, especially people in the environmental field. Um, orbits, operators, observatories, a lot of unfamiliar technical jargon. Um, and we were failing to intersect. Um, one is to talk about, you know, the language that we understand, you know, such as if you talk about the atmosphere, we know what we mean by that. We understand that in environmental, but talking about near earth, you know, orbits or talking about low earth orbit don't mean anything. It's just, it's out there. Um, so, and then again, this concept of intersecting the issues, um, you know, that in order to bring this so that it relates to a wider audience, you need to relate it to the things that they're already invested in, the things that they care about, the issues that they're fighting. Um, if you're fighting right now about the climate crisis, about heat stress, about biodiversity crisis, pollution, saving coral reefs, um, indigenous rights, public health, you have to relate what does this problem that astronomers are talking about, what does it have to do 
with this. And something that I wanna make sure it doesn't get lost in here, and I would love, Maria, since you live in Texas, you know this. One of the things that became really obvious to me that summer is how I myself was failing to disconnect, to connect, I should say, the issues that we're noting um, in astronomy with the issues that my own fellow coworkers were going through. And I'm talking about a space force that's been built in Boca Chica, Texas, um, that is being fast track um, and that, you know, and everything that goes in with it. Again, I am a fan of astronomy space, as I think I mentioned in, in, earlier in the call, you know, I'm one of these crazy people that will drive up to Kennedy Space Center, um, stay overnight and make sure that I get to see um, a launch of something exciting. Um, and the most recent one was the Lucy mission. But what I didn't realize is the human and the wildlife costs when we fast track things in order to race to become the first to the moon, the first to do this, the first to do that. Um, and there's a human price and a wildlife price. And, um, and so I'll, I'll end there, I'll share, you know, one of the things that I will share and I put in the chat, um, I got a chance to then interact with some of my fellow coworkers that are working on this issue. Um, and I attended one of the FAA hearings and I just couldn't believe the things I was hearing. I honestly felt like, you know, like in the movie, don't look up, you know how you had all the chat messages? You know, you have hashtags that were showing up. What was the, the one of the ones that I love? Don't be scared, hashtag. Um, there was the launch challenge, hashtag. There was all these media things um, and crazy things that people were saying. And that's what I heard at that FAA hearing. It's um, people not realizing the human impact. Thank you so much, Diana. Aaron before we bring up uh, Alan Thompson. Thank you uh, so much, everyone, for these excellent comments. And uh, thank you, Deanna, for all, all of that. I, I, one of the things that I want to uh, just at least mention is that from the uh, scientist's point of view, from the communicator's point of view, um, there are so many different uh, researchers and scientists who are able to communicate their science and are able to reach out and engage the public through many different platforms. Some of them have training, some of them just have a knack for it um, or have had informal training in the process. One of the things that I've personally run into and then I also see happening all the time is that there is always an attempt by some different group to change the dialogue, to, to redirect it. And I think that's where we have a lot of the problems that we run into. As an example, um, it's pretty straightforward to show that the number of satellites that we're talking about launching with all the filings and replacing them and maintaining them is going to lead to a deposition of material into the atmosphere of certain critical elements that far exceeds what happens naturally. And you could just write down those numbers and you could just show them and people can understand that. But what then people, some people will do who want to still see things move forward for many different reasons, will then go out and try to find a different number to disprove that or misconstrue a paper in order to disprove what the person was saying and an attempt to do so. And so we see this, and even with something uh, like the, um, the uh, Russian anti-satellite uh, weapon test, which created a tremendous amount of debris, which really endangered the, uh, uh, the, uh, our space infrastructure, the lives of astronauts and cosmonauts and taconauts. Even with that, you saw attempts to completely redirect the conversation. We're saying, oh, look, that's just tears in the rain. You saw this when Russia uh, was tweeting, um, I forget who actually tweeted it, um, but it was, uh, oh, look, the ISS just moved because of a piece of US space junk. 
So you have the West is complaining about all this space junk that we just generated from our weapon test, but here the ISS had to move because of somebody else's space junk, not ours. And so you see this continuous attempt to redirect the conversation. And so it's not just a matter of having the scientists explain what's happening, but it's, it's a matter of keeping that message consistent. And, and that takes, that's a huge collective uh, conversation, a collective action conversation that we need to have. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. You know, um, I haven't heard from Jackie and, and Annette, and so I'm, I, I want to give both of you a chance before we bring up Alan. Anything you want to say? Whatever it is that you want, it's clearly awesome. So, Marva, I think I'm in that mode right now where I'm listening to understand okay. better myself. Got it. Okay. Awesome. I just wanted to just want to give give both of you an opportunity. So, Alan Thompson, are you you in the house? What's up, brother? Yep. Good to hear from you, Marie. But thank you very much for the invitation. <coughs> just All right, wanted Tom to so. My are you, question are you, was, uh, hey, yeah, Alan, are, yeah. you in, are you in, are you in Edinburgh? I'm in Edinburgh, Scotland. Yep, very much so. Have, have, not... have, a, have a wee dram for me after this whole thing, okay? Shall do with with uh, Angela, hopefully sometime soon. <clears throat> All right, brother, um, go ahead. But thanks. Yeah, the question I had was actually very much based to the discussion that we're actually in at the moment. So very much around how can we as society uh, as a space industry, but actually then society take this further and actually be more ambitious about what we need to do about space uh, space debris. Um, so particularly, how can we utilize the Don't Look Up, uh, not just critique it or say how we winced or whatever else it was at watching it, but actually how can we utilize the the, the, the public resonance to actually engage and involve? So it's it's the communication point that Aaron was just making not just communicating about the science of it, but communicating about the life aspect of it that, again, I think Diane mentioned in her, in her activities. How do you express yourself to the man and the, the people in the street? How do you understand that what you're doing is going to change their lives and actually get them motivated to want to do something about it? Um, and and the, question, the question I suppose is have is also part of the response that we're trying to, we as a launch vehicle operator are trying to do at the same time. We're trying to make ourselves relevant because as you can appreciate in the UK, we don't have much of a launch heritage. No one really knows what launch is. No one really knows what space is here. It's all more than an arm's length away. Then you also have these wonderful things called the sustainable development goals, which again, are more than an arm's length away. But again, not many people know about it. How is it relevant to me? So if we take that as an opportunity and try to roll these things together, and uh, I think in the words of Hugh Lewis, uh, how can we be nostalgic about tomorrow's space? What can we do that will help uh, you know, motivate and actually have these, these kind of society-based discussions so that we can elevate the discussion away from uh, being sabotaged by politics, politicians or governments trying to point out that someone else's backyard is worse than our own, but actually take global responsibility and actually you know, come up with some solutions for this, this issue? That's, the, I suppose, the question I have for the panelists. I know we've, we've got work in progress, Mariba, so uh, happy to continue with this at some point, but thanks. Oh yeah, my brother. I, I love that. And I think I think to your point before I kind of open it up, um, it, it reminds me of what Jackie brought up earlier that, um, you know, basically indigenous people uh, have this have this reality that they're in this daily um, kind of environment that is of existential threat. And I think that um, a lot of people don't see themselves in that reality, and maybe be, that does add to, you know, the lethargy and and uh, of action and that sort of thing. But anyway, it was just something that uh, I was thinking about as you were uh, chatting about this. So, anybody from the panel want to? Could I come back? Could I? Yeah, come yeah. Back? On the communication thing, which I think you know, Diane and uh, Aaron and uh, Annette and what uh, Alan was just alluding to as well. This, how do you, so yes, indigenous people are very, you know, you were saying, you know, it's, it's uh, it, you know, they, they're very concerned, they feel very close to and very concerned at the loss of this heritage of, of the skies. And the rest of us are all just sort of running around worried about, you know, COVID or whatever else is coming, so coming at us. But 
if you were actually to, you know, because the people are very concerned, if we were to piggyback this subject uh, on, you know, the, the, the climate change and discuss how, well, if we don't sort this out, the ability to observe the earth um, from, you know, the, the, the advantage of observing the earth and to be able to see the changes, you know, see how climate change is impacting. You can see this faster than we ever could. Aaron mentioned the, C, the, the, the CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons and the ozone problem. I actually worked at Imperial Chemical Industry and I, I promote, I, I, you know, I worked with the engineer who discovered how to remove chlorofluorocarbons from polyurethane foams. But until NASA were able to observe the Earth and were able to give the proof that the ozone layer was in fact being damaged. And so I think if we if we talk about, you know, this this ability to observe this preservation and hook it onto the whole climate change and the urgency that people are feeling, then we can, I think we can anchor this discussion in the psyche, um, which is what they failed to do in the movie, right? I mean, they can anchor this discussion um, to, to something that a lot of people are very concerned about. There are skeptics on climate change, of course, but we'll, you know, I think the majority of people and certainly young kids are very, you know, they're very concerned and they want to play their part. So that's, I would suggest that that's a, a path to finding a solution. I can piggyback off of that as well. Um, that's definitely an angle that we're taking with privateers, helping everyone understand how these things were connected. Um, because again, competing for attention with the climate change crisis is, is a challenge. How do people know what's most important that they should pay attention to? Well, really, these things are interconnected. So how do we actually make this one thing that everyone should be paying attention to? Um, but to sort of build out as well on, on uh, Alan's comments and, and question, you know, there, and backing off of this whole um, ozone CFC thing, right? You look back at that as a case study and some of the things that it really had going for it and why we can call that somewhat of a success is simplicity of messaging. People can understand it, process it quickly an emotional connection, right? How does this affect me? Um, and then simplicity of solution. Oh, I stop using this hairspray and I'm healing the ozone <laughs> hole. I, that's the message that I got as a kid in the nineties in school, right? Just like, oh, we can fix this hole in the ozone by not using hairspray. Great, I have, I have power to do something about this. Yeah. I think psychologically, and in terms of like, I'm a behavioral economics nerd too. I think there are a lot of principles of that to apply here. Humans are very bad at making big long-term decisions. Um, we look at what's in front of us. Um, but, you know, that's, that starts to, um, when you have some agency in the process, um, that's what makes a difference. So mm. like, I look at it as a marketing problem in that sense. And I think we see that a lot in politics as well. Um, on in the US, at least on the Democratic side, communication is so nuanced and we want everyone to understand the details and this is a complex problem with complex solutions and nobody wants to hear it, they want a hashtag because that's the world that we live in. And that's not to say anything bad about humanity, society, the general public as a whole. That's just how we have to be um, given how quickly everything is moving and how much is out there. And maybe it's just like, you know, I was born in the USSR, maybe this is a genetic thing of like, just, you know, turn it into propaganda. But if it, it serves, if it serves the right purpose, you know, propaganda for good. I mean, can I I'm just jump in? in on that? Because oh. I think one of the um, things that I'm hearing that relates to what I said earlier about some of our indigenous concepts, the way we look at stewardship and relationship. So we look at things as being very relational based versus transactional based. And if we can recognize the relationship that Thomas and Aaron and Diana have all discussed and put that in perspective so that 
people understand we are in a relationship. We can't just look at this as a commercial venture and a transactional venture. How does this impact our relationship, whether with each other or with the sky, with space, et cetera? So I just wanted to drop that in there. I, I, I love that. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead, Annette. Uh, yeah, so thanks, Jackie. Um, this is what I see, like we're talking about why is there a, a, a problem with science communication? Well, it's within the tradition of science, that's not a priority. It's the reductionist way of thinking, science. It's divide and conquer. That's how we're trained. That is the foundation of science. Think of Newton, you know, the famous book that he wrote. He wrote the book just to be, he said, a beacon of light for just to get rid of people. So, that, you know, he didn't care about communicating the ideas. So it shouldn't be a surprise that if we have this culture of science that is rooted in reductionist way of thinking, that they don't care about the communication. We don't care about communication as so the institution of science, as a practice of science. It, it's not prioritized. On the other hand, we have media, which is all about um, the, the entertainment and digital culture. And it is about connecting. So to bring in the indigenous perspective, I'm gonna, this is gonna sound really simple, but it is kind of simple, the truth. You know, we have our minds, our bodies, our hearts, our spirits. We have at least four parts that make us whole. Our minds, our bodies, our hearts, our spirits. And let's face it, science is rooted in a universe that only exists within the mind and the body. Everything else is outside of the world of science, mind and body, okay? So in the film and the arts industry, we can talk about heart. We can talk about connecting to people where it really matters, our human humanity. And there's this disconnect. It's not a surprise. It's just where the different cultures are coming from. So my message, reiterating what Jackie was saying too, is that in our indigenous way of knowing, we are connected. We are connected to all living things. And it's because when we acknowledge the source is a spiritual source, we all come from one spirit, all living things. And so that makes us connected to that rock, to that sky, to that star, to that tree, whatever it is. So it's in putting on the lens of science where we can only exist in this world of the mind and the body in order to use reductionist thinking to be able to come up with these great accomplishments. We have gotten as far as we've gotten, but now we need to pull back and say, it's not, that's, that, that doesn't describe our situation. We are also heart, we are also spirit. And when we widen the lens and bring in this indigenous perspective, of our human condition, then we can start to address some of these problems because it's all based on interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. I, I, look, I have to say, Annette, this is, uh, this resonates to my core. I love it. Thank you so much. I'm glad I wasn't the one who said it, but, but you know, I couldn't have said it better. So th 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 thank you so much. Hold, hold on, uh, Deanna, let's go with uh, Aaron, who's had his, your hands have been tired up there, brother. Sorry, man, go ahead. Uh, no, uh, no problems that are uh, more about I'm enjoying listening to what everyone else has to say, because what you're saying is so important here. I want to build on the idea of connectivity. And I think one of the challenges that we face is ultimately how we've been taught to think about outer space. And it actually comes directly with that term outer space. It is something that is beyond earth, that is something outside of us, but it is part of our environment. And to address what uh, Alan was uh, asking us, I think one of the, the first steps that we have to take is to understand that the outer space environment, earth orbit environment is an environment. 
it is connected to the human environment. And what we do there actually has an impact on us here on earth. And that is what we need to establish. Now, fortunately, there is very slow progress toward that. We have the United Nations long-term sustainability goals, which have been hard fought. They don't necessarily go far enough, in my opinion, in multiple areas. Um, but one of the things that they do, which is a major change to the way that space has been discussed, is that they specifically acknowledge outer space as being an environment. And that is so important for moving forward. Because when we could establish that, now we can start saying, all right, so that's an environment. How do we maintain that environment for one space operational safety, but then also for our safety on the ground from re-entries, how we're changing the composition of the atmosphere from both launches and re-entries. And that discussion now can start to flow. Um, so it's acknowledging this problem from the start. And to reiterate something that others have said, uh, just a, perhaps a little bit differently, when it comes to things like space debris and our use of space, the problems that we're creating do not have a purely technical solution. We can't just tech our way out of it because there's also a social action, uh, this collective action problem associated with it. So it's the combination of changing the way we think about it, our behavior, and having the technical know-how in order to have a safe, sustainable space environment that allows us to have that infrastructure to improve the life on Earth, but without the damaging effects that can come from it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diana, and then Thomas. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Um, yeah, so um, I ended up like writing yesterday uh, a comment to, you know, the, the White House uh, set up this uh, council, this uh, advisory council um, to deal with environmental justice issues. And, and to me, connecting with environmental justice issues is, is extremely important, you know, as a Latina Puerto Rican, um, I have, I grew up, you know, and my, fa you know, I have family members that are still experiencing um, different kinds of social and environmental injustices. And, um, and so on this letter that I wrote to them, you know, I, I asked them to imagine, you know, a future, you know, in our children's lifetime, when we don't have any earth observation satellites that can monitor the vital signs, you know, such as things like weather, no GPS satellites to give us location services. Um, our few, you know, adult children no longer able to get early warnings for hurricanes, tornadoes, for wildfires, um, not being able to know where to send relief. Um, you know, like it happened in the case of Hurricane Maria that affected my family in Puerto Rico. Uh, imagine so much debris out there that, and, and I emphasize this, I didn't call it, you know, I said orbiting the earth atmosphere to again, make that connection. This is our environment um, at speeds that are many times faster than bullets. Again, making that connection. This is not just debris that is very far away from each other, but it's traveling so incredibly fast that the distance between each other really does matter. Um, you know, and, and so imagine no longer being able to allow us to put any more satellites in space, no longer able to even defend our planet. Um, and my ask to them, and I don't know whether, you know, I realize there's so much time in here, but at least within here from the US, right? Because my, my sphere is mainly working on, on US related policies is, we took a look at, you know, what is our own role on this? Um, and, and right now we have a problem with both, particularly the FCC and the FAA, not having the proper uh, regulatory framework in place. One is to make sure that, you know, that we connect what happens at spaceports with what happens with the cargo, you know, the payloads that these things are putting up in space. Um, and so, I, you know, I just want to encourage anybody who is listening in, um, you know, you have to, 
You have to forget about fear and just speak up. Um, you know, I, I, I like to think that, you know, we will never get to that place um, in the film, you know, where Kate, for example, say, you know, I'm grateful we tried. I want to make sure that, that I'm say, glad to say that I'm grateful that we tried and we made a difference. Mm. Oh, yeah, I, I love it. Thomas. Yeah, this is like uh, the best connection for what I want to say. Thank you very much. Because the harsh truth is, right, that when you zoom out, this is not a space problem. This is a problem of how we organize life on this planet as humankind together. And that's where we're struggling, right? Because when you look back, we were not tasked with a lot of things, right? We were uh, in caves at one point, we went out of the caves, we went hunting, we went, you know, becoming tribes and all these things is like literally, who said it before, the task in front of you, I think it was Diana. The task in front of you was the one that needed to be solved and that was it. And then, um, you know, all the organization changed. People, you know, moved together, systems were established. And um, suddenly there were a few people that have understood that you can become insanely powerful and very, very wealthy when you understand how to solve the problem that is 100 steps away and not just one. And you make everybody march in that direction, right? And, um, you know, the good old age of capitalism began. And now we have another age that is upon us, which is um, the age of technology, right? Which essentially, again, makes us all equal because everybody has a mobile phone. Everybody has the technology at their disposal. But we are prevented on, of taking equal action together because of the systems that have been established 200, 300 years ago. And that is really the challenge, right? We do understand information wise, what we have to do is like, you know, we don't want to talk about war anymore because, you know, we want to talk about how we can become and stay together as humans and actually die for each other rather than against each other, right? And uh, we can't, somehow our thinking is not like that, right? And the biggest uh, jump will have to be that we do understand that to really make it really powerful, that we connect the technology that is there with the spirit and heart that we have here and really understand to these two things and make them one to save this planet and make this the place to live for everybody. And it's very, very hard because I can do it even I'm going on holiday in the Mediterranean, although I know that people are dying in the sea, just trying to get to Europe, right? Do I massively care? Yeah, it's in my mind. Does it stop me from going on holiday? Absolutely not. Does it get me into action? Maybe some things I do are for that. Does it help at the moment? Probably not. And this devastating feeling is the feeling that we have to overcome to find our own powers back that we can do these things together. And I hear it from every speaker on this panel that um, you know, politics are ho is holding us back, systems are holding us back, things that have been established, right? This is essentially you know, not about the FAA. This is about the urge to communicate these things together and do this for everybody. Everybody counts. And, I guess the hardest part for us is to overcome this little step-by-step -step thinking and know that this has already been passed. We've got the technology. We now have to unite and do the right thing for this planet together and achieve this together. Thank you so much, Thomas. So here's the deal. Um, it, it, we're, 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 we're coming to time for final statements. As everybody's been talking, um, I've realized that we actually probably should have like a whole day long workshop on this because um, there's so much to unpack. And I feel that we're just uh, scraping the surface. So this tells me that this is a great topic uh, that we all converged on. One of the things that I was thinking while well, Thomas and others were, were speaking is that um, it's like, you know, part of the power play across humanity is in asymmetric dependencies um, and, and, you know, people's reaction to uh, being on the on the bad end of the asymmetric dependency is to try to become independent, 
but then when when we're all independent we kind of don't care about other people because it's, it's like i don't need you because i can take care of myself i can do everything on my own i think i think we need to start trying to move the world not to become everybody become independent but for the dependencies to become symmetric instead of so asymmetric and if we can make the dependencies symmetric people realize yeah actually i do need you actually i do need you actually you do need me actually we need each other and i think that is uh, an important way to try to progress the conversation so with that i'm going to do a lightning round everybody gets to make some final statements and um you know i'm just gonna start with uh aaron and and oh by the way talking about communication i just gonna shameless plug that you know clearly the mission of spacewatch.global is communicating this stuff so so it's in the mission of spacewatch.global so I'm, I'm glad that uh you know torsten and, and Kara exist to, to allow us to do these things so aaron quick statement finalize connecting with the theme of this discussion everyone please look up uh, you can actually see the change of the night sky if you take the time to do so and this is something that then everyone could connect with and we can work toward uh, a problem uh, to addressing the space sustainability problem uh, together uh, if we can acknowledge that there is an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Diana. Uh, you know, I don't have anything like elegant to say other than um, yeah. just do your you thing. Know, that I, I, I'm just looking at a headline that just came up on, on New York Times. Um, you know, back in last summer, uh, when a bunch of scientists, you know, got together and we're talking about, you know, the different issues about, um, you know, mega constellations of satellites, you know, somebody brought in about, you know, have you thought about solar activity? How does that impact? And sure enough, you know, now we have headlines um, of supposedly some of the startling satellites, uh, you know, potentially being lost because of um, solar activity. Um, and that it just again reminds me of, again, that whole concept as to why I didn't even want to watch the film is because astronomers were telling you <laughs> and we were ignoring them. And how many times have we done that? I mean, it, it just, I, I just cannot express my incredible amount of gratitude for all of you that have chosen that field. Um, and I apologize to all of us, you know, from all of us that, that I keep ignoring you. And I, and I hope I keep on being a good ally and so that you can be heard. Thank you so much, Deanna. All right, Jackie. So going off of what Aaron just said, uh, yes, I think it's important that we look up. And in looking up, I think it's also important for us to recognize that these conversations are important. They're an important part of communications. And however uncomfortable it is for us to acknowledge whether it's a threat or a change, that we have to acknowledge them so that we can follow through and act upon them. And so I think it's very important. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Tomas. Yeah, I want to thank the panelists for, for being in this discussion because it's an uncomfortable one for sure. We have nicer things to talk about. Sustainability is hard and uh, sustainability shouldn't be just a lip service. Um, and we should be very transparent of, about the things that we can achieve, right? The things that we can achieve with technology, the things that we can achieve with the current systems. And I think that the public is going to honor transparency and honesty. And that's what we absolutely should give them. This is our duty. And at Space Hero, that's exactly what we are going to do. We will tell that story of how you can make a global project sustainable. And we will tell about the trials and tribulations and the struggles that we have every day, because that's what people can relate. Thank you. Thank you. Angela Matisse. So two prompt. Um, we need to engage, uh, help people understand what it means for their everyday lives. And so that, as we said, if people are concerned about the environment, how do, must we protect those assets that are, are going around the planet 
and understand that yes, as everyone has said, that it is part of Earth environment. I love that, um, Diana. I think it's fantastic. But on the other end of the scale, which I probably jumped right in at the beginning a bit too heavy on, but you know, we need to create that international collaboration and unity of purpose. Because to your point, Moriba, the let's get symmetry of skin in the game is what I was saying. You know, it has to matter to everyone that we sort this problem because it does matter. But while we we do the game of, well, we want to do the best project for space and we've got our space platform and we want to do a project to Mars, these things will turn to dust. It will turn into conflict. As I said before, you can tolerate it on planet Earth, this natural human competitiveness in space there is for us to have that kind of tension or to have those individualistic approaches to it. So let's find that unity of purpose because we have to. Thank you so much. All right, bring it on home, Diana. Diana? Diana? Diana, Diana. G-Money. Um, G-Money. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've just really enjoyed this conversation. And again, as somewhat of a newcomer to the space, I think that what I have to contribute to the conversation is a reminder. Um, I think Angela, you mentioned echo chambers. Um, I think what I found recently is um, there's, there's a lot of talking to ourselves as there is in every field. Uh, how do we pierce through to that awareness level of the broader public? And so, embracing opportunities like cultural moments like don't look up i think is critical to that we need to remember that for many many people who watched that movie that was the one time of the entire year that they even thought about science astronomy um any of those topics so how can we latch into that and build upon it effectively um i think it takes investment, right? We've invested in a lot of other areas, our time and resources and efforts. Um, let's make sure that we're getting the level of awareness that this deserves. And uh, I think that takes accepting what the world is like, putting ourselves in the shoes of the general public and understanding what it takes to make them really care and feel connected to this issue. Beautiful. Look, um... I, I, I wish we had more hours, uh, actually. I'm, 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 I'm sad, actually. I'm, I'm actually crying inside that uh, our time is up for this session. But with that said, I want to thank everybody so much, and I want to hand it back to uh, Kiara and Torsten to, bring, to finish bringing, bringing it on home. Everybody can. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for this inspiring talk. And just this was definitely a lot of food for thought. It was super exciting. Um, yes, before I dive in, just a quick save the date that our next more of us Vox Populi will be on the 7th of April at 4 p.m. CST. So sign up for that for sure. Um, and yes, as it was just briefly mentioned, um, we at Space Watch fully believe that space should be used for all humanity and it enables knowledge and enriches societies and we want to continue to provide trusted information for everyone. So for that we need, as Angela said, collaboration and unity. So we do really need your support and input and please keep providing us with ideas, feedback, like you've done before. Um, yes, and before we head off, I would like to briefly give a rundown of our next exciting upcoming events because we have quite a lot happening in the next weeks. So next week holds some more awesome events. It is also the week of the Space Summit in Toulouse. And we're gonna kick it off on the 14th of February with our next Space Cafe Brazil by Ian Grosner, together with Rafael, Rafael Rotgen, and this will be done in Portuguese. Then on the 15th of February, we have our 33 minutes with Ran Livna from the Ramon Foundation in Israel, and he will be talking about the upcoming Red Commission with Axiom. On the 17th of February, we have our next Space Cafe Germany by Andreas Schäfers with Volker Schmidt, the head of the Cosmic Kiss Mission. And this will be hosted in German. 
And then a day later, we have our Space Cafe Scotland by the wonderful Angela, who's also here on the panel. Uh, and she will be talking to Alan Thompson from Skyrora. On the 22nd of February, we then have a 32 minutes with Dr. Anna Christmann and Dr. Walter Pelzer to get the German perspective on the outcomes of the aforementioned Space Summit. On the 24th of February, we have our very first Space Cafe Austria, which is hosted by the wonderful Judith Delaney. And on the 25th of February, we have our next Space Cafe Canada by Dr. Jessica West. As always, all our events are going to be online on Eventbrite. And we love to hear your feedback. So please do check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up for our daily and our bi-weekly newsletters. And if you wanna treat yourselves to something special, become a Space Watcher today or help us in our supportive program. Again, a huge thank you to Morba, Angela, Aaron, Jackie, Diana, Diana, and Thomas for this inspiring talk and for being our guests. And thanks again to the entire team behind the scenes for doing that great job week in and week out. I hope that you all stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you everyone in the audience for joining us, for participating so actively in the chat. And I hope to see you all in the next weeks. In the meantime, visit our website, follow us on social media, and don't forget, become a Space Watcher. Thank you.